This morning we're continuing in Mark's Gospel, if you would please turn in your Bibles. To uh, Mark chapter 9, I am going to back up just a bit and uh, read from verse 31 of chapter 8 through verse 1 of chapter 9. And the reason why I'm doing that uh, actually has to do with, with the debate. Um, if you go through the different synoptic Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll find that this passage we're looking at this morning comes at the end of what Jesus just said, what we looked at last week in, in Mark 8. But in some of the Gospels, you'll find that they include um, this verse either with what comes before it, that is, when Jesus was speaking to them about necessity, laying down their lives and following him, and some of the Gospels actually place it with what comes next, the transfiguration, because uh, the translators of the Bible, and particularly the person who uh, actually put the verses and chapters in here in the first place, I think it was Stephanus, uh, didn't know exactly which text it went with. So we're going to um, fig try to figure that out this morning and to actually see that it doesn't, it, it doesn't really come with the transfiguration. It really does go with what came before, and we're going to want to see why that is. So let's begin reading in uh, Mark chapter 8 in verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. He summoned the multitude with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels shall save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. May God bless his word to our understanding this morning. Now again, I think it's important that we look at what took place last week in order to understand why Jesus is saying what he is saying in, in the ninth chapter of verse 1, our text this morning. Remember that last week our Lord Jesus pointed out to us that he doesn't want you to set your mind and your heart on the things of this world on the things that you want from this life, but rather on the things that he wants to do through your life. After all, you do belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this was a lesson that we saw that Peter had to learn. After Jesus, well, Jesus told his disciples in no uncertain terms that he was going to suffer and die at the hands of the leaders of Israel and that after three days he would rise again, Peter steps up and he says, this is not going to happen to you, Lord. This did not fit Peter's idea of what Jesus ought to be doing. And so he rebuked his Lord. But we also saw that Jesus, in turn, rebuked him. Peter, you're only thinking about the things that you want. And whether his intentions were good or bad, it didn't really matter because he needed to set his mind on the things that God wanted and not the things that he wanted. He needed to give up his own will. He needed to die to himself. <coughs> Jesus said he needed to pick up his cross and follow Jesus. Now, Jesus says to you that that's what you need to do as well. If you manage to gain the things that you're after, the things that you're willing to give your soul up in order to obtain, you'll find in the end that not one of them is worth the price because you're going to lose everything. Once you've lost what is most important, which is your soul, you would gladly give everything that you paid 
to everything that you, that you gained by giving up your soul to get it back. As a matter of fact, we saw Edward said that you would give the world, if you could, even to reduce your pain a little bit in hell. But you need to realize that Jesus has given to you the opportunity now to use your life now for his glory, to store up riches in heaven where you can keep them forever, to, to take advantage of those opportunities and things that he gives you now in order to make things, as it were, more glorious for you uh, hereafter. But the way that you do this is not by insisting on your own way, doing your own thing, seeking for your own glory, but rather by trusting the Lord and surrendering your life to him for your glory or for his glory. Now, this is one of the reasons why Jesus says we should set our mind on God's interests and not our own. He says, first, if we hold on to our lives, we will lose them. When Jesus Christ comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels on the day of his judgment, he will be as ashamed of us then as we were of him now unless we let go of the world and use the brief time that we have in this world to glorify him and not ourselves. Now, that's the first reason why Jesus says they should give up their lives and serve him, is because if they don't, they will lose their lives. But he gives us another reason now, actually giving it to them, but it also applies to us. Why we should lose our lives, why we should let go of them, why we should set our mind on his interests, and that's because the kingdom has come from our perspective. It would come from their perspective. And if I can confuse you a little bit more, it's also going to come from our perspective in the future with greater power. So what they were looking forward to has come already for us, but there is still another stage of the kingdom that is future to us. And that should influence the way that we live now. Now that's what Jesus was telling his disciples was about to happen. The kingdom was about to come with power. Now, I, I hope you already know what this kingdom is that Jesus is referring to. It is the kingdom of which he is the king. It is the redemptive kingdom, the kingdom which his father was giving to him. As we've already read, his rule over the nations, which we know it, we're not going to look exactly at what it is, except in Psalm 72, you've already seen it. It's a, a kingdom of blessing. It's a, a benevolent rule. It's one in which God showers his blessings upon those who walk in his ways. It comes only through the gospel. And it's something that our Lord gives us indications that one day is going to fill the whole world. Now, what does the Lord mean that it was about to come with power? What it means is he was about to take up his rule. At this point, Jesus had not yet been exalted to the right hand of the Father. He had, was not yet exerting the power of that rule, but he was about to take it up. And he was about to use that authority to advance his kingdom. Now, the important question is, when was that going to happen? Well, here's where there's a difference of opinion and the reason why this verse gets put sometimes with the, the, the verses that go before it, sometimes with the verses that come after it. Some believe that he was talking about what was going to happen next, which is the transfiguration, which is what we're going to look at next week, Lord willing. In the next few verses, we're going to read about Jesus taking his most intimate disciples to the top of a mountain and revealing to them something of his person and his glory. He's going to pull back, as it were, the veil of his humanity in a certain sense. Not really, but just his humility, I think would be a better way to put it, and show them his future glory, the glory that Jesus was going to receive when he ascended to the right hand of the Father that glory which he was to receive as a part of the reward for his work of redemption, being exalted as Lord over all creation. Now, it's certainly possible that that is what Jesus was referring to, again, which is why the, the, the verse moves around, as it were. But it doesn't seem to make the best sense in the context, because take, just consider this for a moment. Jesus says in verse 2 of chapter 9 that the transfiguration was going to take place six days, six days later. But in our text, Jesus says that there's only some of those who were present at the time he was speaking that were going to be alive 
when this event happened. Now, was he saying that most of the people he was speaking to there were going to die in the next six days? Now, I think it's very unlikely that that happened unless a large portion of the crowd died off. Certainly, that was not true of the disciples. Okay, so I don't think he was talking about the transfiguration here. Now, others believe he was speaking about the day of Pentecost. Certainly, that's a possibility because on that day, after Jesus had ascended to the right hand of the Father and crowned king, he poured out his spirit upon his disciples, giving them the power to advance his kingdom in this world. And certainly, this is one of the main ways that the kingdom of heaven advances and that the Lord causes it to move forward is by giving his people his Holy Spirit that they might have the courage and the desire actually to move the kingdom forward. But again, consider, he says that only some of those who were standing there were going to live to see this. And the day of Pentecost was really only about a year away from when Jesus said this. So was Jesus saying that the majority of those listening to him at that time were going to die within that year? Well, again, I don't think that that is likely either. I don't think that that's the view, thing that Jesus had in view here, the day of Pentecost. But there was one other event that Jesus could be referring to that was a little ways off and a time at which most of those who were there at that time would be gone and that is 70 A.D. Now, this was certainly another very important event in the history of, well, Christ's redemptive kingdom. The destruction of the temple, the Lord's putting away his unfaithful bride, Israel. And certainly it was an exhibition of the power of the kingdom of God. It was no accident that that event took place. Jesus not only predicted that it was going to happen, and of course the reason why was because they would reject him, but he also said that he was the one who would bring it about. Now he didn't necessarily say that to his disciples in so many words, but it was prophesied of him, and he is after all the spirit of prophecy. He is the word of God, he's the one who's given to us all those prophetic uh, pronouncements of what was going to happen in the future. Now, Jesus did this, basically himself, taking up his rule as king by advancing the armies of Rome against Jerusalem. Now, he did it through the armies of Rome, but it was still his work. This is one controversial passage, but I think it kind of opens at least our understanding to what it means. But this is in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. It's often used to refer to this antichrist who is going to arise and deceive Israel and help them build their temple, and then he's going to turn against them and so forth and destroy the temple. That's the way that this is often interpreted in dispensational churches. But in the context, Gabriel, who is giving this prophecy to Daniel, is actually talking about Messiah the Prince who is going to come at the end of those 70 weeks, or at least at the end of 69 of those weeks. But he says this, the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The prince who is coming is the Messiah, the prince. And the people of the prince who actually destroyed the city and the sanctuary were the Romans. What it's saying here is that they were his people. In other words, Jesus was using the Romans as his army to carry out his judgment in the work of his kingdom. And this is the coming, I believe, that Jesus was speaking of in Matthew chapter 26 when he said to the high priest, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus told him he would see the exertion of the kingdom of heaven into the world in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. I believe that's what Jesus was referring to when he told the high priest that he would see it. In other words, he would be alive to see the Lord's judgment upon Israel, and through that, he would see the advancement of God's kingdom. This imagery of coming on the clouds of heaven is used several times by the Lord in the Old Testament to refer to his predict, well, to his judgment against the nations. The Lord represents himself as riding on the chariots of heaven 
coming in judgment against the nation, same thing that our Lord Jesus was doing here. He wasn't talking about his second coming in that passage, but rather he was talking about the kingdom of heaven coming in power. The psalmist writes this, Psalm 104, verse 3. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wings of the wind. And just one example of where the Lord represents himself as coming in judgment against the nation on the clouds, in which he did not come physically or literally down to do this, but came nonetheless in judgment to destroy that nation. Isaiah 19, verse 1. The oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. This is talking about God's judgment against Egypt. He did not come in some kind of physical way. He didn't literally come down to earth, but he represents himself as riding on a cloud, coming in judgment against them. That's what Jesus said he was going to do. He told the high priest that is what he was going to do, and the way he was going to do it was through the Romans. Now, what Jesus is saying then in this particular passage in Mark 9, verse 1, he's saying that he was about to take up the exercise of his power and that he was going to pour his judgments out on the nation that should have received him but crucified him instead as a criminal. And this is just one way that the power of his kingdom was about to be revealed. But it was an obvious one. It was an event that was going to take place some 40 years from the time that Jesus spoke it, which is why he said, only some of you would be alive when it takes place and you would see it. Now, another reason why Jesus told them that this was going to happen is because it's another reason why they should lay down their lives and follow after him. It's not only because of the possibility of losing their souls if they don't, which is the most important thing. But the fact is that if they cling to Israel, if they cling to the old, go back to the Old Testament shadows, they would perish with that nation. And certainly once they died, that would seal the loss of their souls forever. Why should they set aside their own interests and follow after the Lord? Because his kingdom was about to exert itself with power in the world. And if they remained a part of the world, at least part of the old covenant system, they would perish with it, but if they picked up their crosses and followed after him, they would live. Now, I don't think I have to tell you this morning, though I will tell you, that this is also why you should lay your life down as well, because this applies to you as well as to them. The kingdom of heaven is continuing to exert its power in the world, and one day it is going to be a world-dominating force, it actually is already, but we don't see the Lord exulting, exerting his full authority and power yet to bring about the submission of the nations. He does that systematically through the proclamation of the gospel. But if you hold on to your life and on to this world, when this world is eventually going to perish, you will perish with it, even as they, if they held on to the Old Testament system, would perish with it. But if you devote your life to the service of Jesus Christ in advancing his kingdom, you will be a part of that kingdom forever. So again, this passage exhorts you to give yourself to him and to his cause. Now that's what the passage, I believe, means, but let's look at a couple of things regarding this, especially the question of how can you do this? How can you advance his kingdom? How can you join, as it were, these ranks, lay down your life, and advance the kingdom of heaven, and what is it that he is doing to help you advance the kingdom? Again, Jesus isn't kind of kicking you out on the front lines and withdrawing and saying, here, you fight the battle by yourself. He is actually fighting along with you to advance a kingdom that cannot be defeated, one that is going to fill the whole earth, one that uh, is going to last forever. So, I mean, you are fighting in the winning army. Well, there are two ways that, the, that we've seen that the kingdom of heaven actually ex exerts itself into this world and grows. 
in, in our survey of what we've just been looking at. The first one is by the Spirit's influence in your heart. He gives you power to advance the kingdom. But the second way is the king himself is acting more directly in the history of this world, in the events of this world, to advance the kingdom of heaven. So for you to be successful in advancing the kingdom of heaven, you do need to understand both of these are going on. You need to know how these are working to your advantage. So let's consider them for a couple of moments. For those of you who have the outline, we're going to look at uh, two points. The first one is that the Lord has given you his spirit to advance his kingdom. And again, the second one is that the Lord is acting directly in world events to advance his kingdom. So first of all, the Lord has given you his spirit to advance his kingdom in the world. Now, I already told you, this isn't exactly what Jesus has in mind in this text, but it's still one of the main ways that he pushes the kingdom of heaven forward. Jesus gave us the marching orders of what we are to be doing in the Great Commission when he said, go and make disciples of all the nations and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. But Jesus also said that he would be with them to the end of the age. Now, he may have been referring to the age of the Old Testament system. We may be in the age to come in which uh, the Lord said the unforgivable sin would not be forgiven. I only bring that up just to say that there was an age that was coming in which that sin might be committed. But what Jesus said to them is just as true of you and me. Jesus will be with us to the end of this age to do his work and his will. And the way in which he is present with us is by his Holy Spirit. When he said to his disciples in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses, that applies to you and to me as well. And when they prayed after they had been threatened by the leaders of Israel and the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness, that applies to you and it applies to me if we are trusting the Lord Jesus. The Lord says he has given you this power already. He, is, he gave you his spirit when he saved you. And since, of course, the spirit's influence can be stronger or weaker, he also gave you the command. Don't be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. So if you want to be strong in God's kingdom and be used of the Lord to advance the kingdom then it's up to you to use the means God has given to you to gain more of the Spirit of God. You have to use the means. You have to be in the Word of God. You have to be someone who is given to prayer. You do need to gather and worship with the people of God because these are the means by which God will give you strength and power. If you're a Christian here this morning, you know that's true. As you engage by faith in these things, God does strengthen you. The love that you have in your heart for him increases, and with it, your ability to advance the kingdom of heaven. Now, you must also resist temptation. Jesus says you must die to yourself. You have to resist the world. You have to separate yourself from the world. And then, of course, you need to step out in faith and do what the Lord calls you to do. Again, the statement that Greg brought up recently is one that we really need to bear in mind, and that is the Lord comes when we go. The Lord does not come and then we go, at least most often that doesn't happen. Don't wait until you feel like you're ready to do it. You're not gonna feel like you're ready until you actually step out and begin to do it. That's when you're going to sense the Lord's help, and that's what makes you ready. So step out in faith, as well as die to yourself, as well as use the means of grace. The Lord has already told us we need to go. We just need to obey, and then the power will come. So again, the Lord advances his kingdom by empowering his servants with the Holy Spirit to advance the kingdom of heaven. But let's not forget the second way that he advances his kingdom and that is by exercising his power more directly in the world. 
Working in the hearts of his people by his spirit is not the only way that God works in this world to advance the kingdom of heaven, though it is perhaps the main way. And here I want to diverge just for a moment, especially when the Lord pours his spirit out in revival. And that's something we ought to be praying for all the time. We've looked at these movements in the history of the church, haven't we, where the Lord brought revival. We saw this through the Reformation series, actually, through the pre-Reformation movements that the Lord brought about when he moved on the hearts of just a simple group of men called the Waldenses to return to first century Christianity and get away from all that superstitious junk and begin proclaiming the gospel just in the way that Jesus and the disciples did. That was one of the things the Lord used to advance his kingdom. Boy, what a Profound idea. Let's do it the way the disciples did it. Let's do it the way Jesus did it. Uh, certainly, he worked through Wycliffe and the Lollards. He basically translated the Bible into English, trained some men to go out and preach the gospel. Again, like the Waldenses, the simple message of the gospel. And the Lord brought revival through John Huss and, of course, others at the Reformation bringing again about not only the revealing of his truth in the gospel, but also putting it on the hearts of so many to embrace that gospel. I think there was a revival during the years of the Puritans, certainly during the Great Awakening, which we began to look at last year in the Reformation series and are going to continue to look at this year as we look at the Great Awakening in New England. But there was also the New York revival and the Welsh revivals. The Lord, from time to time, will greatly pour out of His Spirit and advance the kingdom of heaven. And during these times, God's people find greater power to do God's will. And God, as I've said, well, basically does great things through ordinary people. Now, one thing let me just say before we leave this point and look at what what this text is really about, and, and that is... When you read about those revivals and you see what the Lord was doing and you see the great things that he accomplished and just the love the people had for him and the sacrifices they made for him, when you read those things and you look at your own life, sometimes you can become discouraged. Why am I not like them? Why don't I love the Lord the way they did? One thing you have to be careful about is that Whenever you compare yourself to someone during a time of revival, you're probably always going to fall short of what they had because you don't have the Spirit of God in as great a measure as what they had because that was a time when God was pouring out His Spirit in greater measure. So don't get discouraged when you read about that, but instead let their example encourage you to seek more of the Spirit of God because I believe that if you really earnestly seek the Lord, that you can be like that. It's just that in these days, they didn't have to perhaps labor as hard as we do in order to attain it because God was giving more of his spirit in those days. But again, you can have that degree too, but I think it's just going to take a bit more work, a bit more in the means of grace, asking God for that spirit and that filling of the spirit. But we should also pray that God would pour out of his spirit and advance his kingdom through that means, because that's one of the ways that Jesus fulfills what he's saying here, that the kingdom of God comes with power. Sometimes it does with great power in these outpourings of the Spirit. We should pray for that. And certainly that's one thing we do when we meet together for prayer, but let's not forget to do that in our private prayers as well. But let's not forget that the Lord is also at work in the affairs of this world to advance his kingdom, because let's You know, this divorce of Israel in 70 AD, this was not a revival. And yet it was a a means by which God advanced his kingdom, a means by which King Jesus executed judgment and basically got one of the church's greatest enemies out of the way. There's a lot said today about God uh, turning back to the Jews as a Jewish nation and, and taking this faithless bride back to himself. It is true that God saves Jews. You know, he has turned to the Gentiles in order to provoke them to jealousy. He is still saving Jews, but he doesn't have a separate plan for the Jews. He actually moved them out of the way. He actually brought judgment against them in 70 AD to get them out of the way of his church so that his church could grow because they were the number one persecutors of the church of Christ. Now, again, um, 
that God moved them out of the way so that the gospel could go forward. And again, God was certainly not unjust in doing that. He had offered to each and every one of those Jews the gospel before he brought judgment. They all had the opportunity. The vast majority of them rejected. The vast majority of them turned against the church. The Lord moved them out of the way. That was the exertion of the kingdom of heaven as it came with power. That was a direct act of the Lord Jesus Christ as king against his enemies. He even wept over what was going to happen to them because they rejected him and he was going to bring this judgment. So the Lord is, as a matter of fact, working within history. His kingdom is exerting power in history to advance the kingdom of heaven. Perhaps the second instance of this would be Constantine, although some have mixed opinions over what happened here. I mean, Constantine actually did end the Roman persecutions against the church and declared Christianity to be the legal religion of the Roman Empire. Now, we know that that was a double-edged sword. We do know that that caused a great deal of paganism to enter into the church, and we do know that that is essentially the birth, dare I say, of the Roman church, the Roman Catholic church, and Eastern Orthodoxy. When all that stuff flooded into the church, that was not a good thing. It did hurt the church doctrinally, but it also opened the door for Christianity to expand throughout the entire world at that time. No persecution equals a softer and more corrupt church. That's certainly true. I mean, just look at the church today. But it does open the door to the committed few who really do know the Lord to get the gospel out to others, as it certainly does today. Uh, a persecuted church is a purer church, but it's also a church that, that I would think has fewer opportunities to spread the gospel because it goes underground largely. But a church that is not persecuted, though it may be, again, somewhat more corrupted, there's still going to be those who know the Lord and who are going to seek to do His will who will have opportunities that you would not have under the circumstances of a persecuted church. Now, I think that we are in the situation of the non-persecuted, perhaps more corrupt environment. But that gives us opportunities that we wouldn't have if persecution forced us underground. So we should use that opportunity now to share the gospel of Christ. So again, the Lord advances his kingdom by moving on Constantine's heart to make Christianity the legal religion of Rome and to move away from emperor worship. The Reformation was a time of revival. But it couldn't take place unless the Lord had been moving within the world and in society to bring about certain changes. For one thing, he, put it, he allowed, I should say, didn't actually put it on Pope Leo X's heart to do this, but allowed him to desire to build this great edifice known as St. Peter's Cathedral. In order to do that, he had to raise money. So he said, okay, let's make plenary indulgences available to everyone. We'll, we'll just charge a modest fee for it, but we'll raise money for St. Peter's Basilica by simply selling indulgences. So Leo allowed that to take place. And then the Lord allowed Tetzel, who was out there selling these indulgences, to go overboard in what he was saying you could get through these, which was complete forgiveness of sins if you buy this indulgence. That's not what they meant by it originally, but that's the way he was marketing that. And that, in turn, incensed Luther to write his theses, his 95 theses, and to post them on the door for a public debate. And basically, that started the Reformation. The Lord also put it on the heart of Frederick the Wise to protect Luther. And, of course, on many different occasions, providentially protected him so that the Reformation could go forward. The Lord changed the hearts of many of the princes in those days to embrace the Protestant faith, which is basically the gospel as opposed to Romanism and to break with Rome. And that's why the Reformation was able to go forward in Luther's day. When it didn't through those pre-Reformation movements, it was because the Lord Jesus Christ exerted his power in history to change things. He's able to do that. And the Lord actually does that because he is the Lord of history. He said to his disciples before he sent them out with his great commission, all authority 
has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He has that authority. He took up that authority when he ascended to heaven. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 10, verses 12 through 13. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. The Lord Jesus Christ is exercising that authority right now. He is the one who is ruling. We heard that from many of, of, of our, our youth that were, were asking questions yesterday. You know, what is Jesus doing now? Well, he's ruling, and he's overruling all things for the good of his church. He is subduing his enemies under his feet, and he is advancing his kingdom. You realize with all authority and power that there is nothing that Jesus Christ cannot do if he wills to do it. And the Bible says that he wills that one day his kingdom will fill the whole earth. Again, going back to the prophecy of uh, the book of Daniel, when Jesus, when actually um, uh, the, the, the prophet Daniel, as he was interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream, was speaking about Jesus' kingdom. At the time it would be set up, in the days of the Caesars of Rome, this is what he says is going to happen. In the days of those kings, that is the Caesars of Rome, according to the understanding of that prophecy, the, the uh, statue had the feet mixed with uh, iron clay and the ten toes representing the ten kings or, or the ten Caesars. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed and that kingdom will not be left for another people. That is, no one's going to overtake it and conquer it, and then it's going to be absorbed into their kingdom the way the other kingdoms represented by the statue would. That kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Now, that kingdom was represented by the stone that shattered the feet of the statue and then grew into a great mountain that filled the whole earth, that kingdom of Christ is going to fill the whole earth. That is what he is exercising his authority to do right now, to subdue all of his enemies. And the last enemy, of course, will be death, and he will subdue that one when he comes again on the last day. Now, what does this mean for you personally, as far as the Lord's exercising this authority? Well, the Lord is going to accomplish his will. And he's going to do it through you and through me because we are his servants. We are his soldiers. We are his body. We are his hands and his feet. We are his mouths, as it were, to speak. Now, you may not know exactly what the Lord is going to do in, in every case. We don't know how he's going to move upon people in history. We don't know when we set out to do something whether God is going to grant you success in what you're hoping to do in the battles that you believe that he's called you to fight. But you can know this, that if it is his will, you will succeed. And even if you don't succeed in what you're seeking to do, you can know that it's going to be better for his kingdom that you not succeed in that particular thing. The Lord is sovereign over all things. And he doesn't always will the things we think he's going to do, but he's working all of these things together to advance his kingdom and his glory in this world. The Lord will do what is best, and he has the power to do what is best. So just remember this, that the Lord doesn't expect you necessarily to take responsibility for the things that are outside of your control, the things that are entirely in his hands. He just expects you to be faithful in doing what he has called you to do. And he's called you to do these things. Grow in grace, grow in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be filled with his Holy Spirit and then seek to glorify him in your life through basically your obedience, especially in being a witness of his truth by sharing the gospel with others and also by exhibiting the reality of that truth in your life 
in the power of a changed life. That's all you can do, right? You can't manipulate history. But with regard to the things that are in God's hands or in the Lord Jesus Christ's hands, make sure that you pray and ask him to do the things that you believe to be his will, but always leave it into his hands exactly what it is that the Lord's going to do. I mean, he does have a plan, and he is working it out. But we don't always know what it is, which is why we always have to say, Lord, if it is your will, do this and do that. Now, finally, let's just take a step back for a moment and remember that this is a reason that the Lord is giving to his disciples and giving to you as to why you should lay down your life and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in light of this, he's asking you a question this morning. What are you going to do in light of the fact that the kingdom of heaven has come with power? One day it is going to exhibit even greater power and become the dominant force of this world. What are you going to do in light of that? Are you going to hold on to your life and seek after the things that you want and live your lives the way you want to live them? Well, if you do this, Jesus has already said he's going to be ashamed of you on the day when he brings his eternal kingdom and you will lose your souls forever. But if you lay down your life, if you let go of what you want to do, if you pick up your cross and follow him, he's given you some promises here. He is going to empower you with his Holy Spirit. He is going to give you the strength you need to live for him, to serve him, to glorify him. And he's also said that he will make everything in this world conspire together to help you in your fight for him. So our Lord invites you again this morning to give yourself to his cause by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, by turning from your sins, and by following him. If you do, you know that Christ has promised that he will be with you to the end of the age to empower you and to make sure that his will is going to be done through what you're doing. And as a believer, I can't think of anything more encouraging than that because we all want to see the kingdom of heaven advance. The Lord says he will do it through us and he will make sure that this world will also help us along the way. We just need to trust him and serve him. May the Lord give each of us the grace then to do exactly that. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord privately in our silent prayers to give us the grace to do what he has exhorted us to do this morning.